welcome to the Atheist Experience. We are live. It is Sunday, June 27th, 2021, unless you're watching this afterwards, in which case it's not, but I can't do anything about when you're actually going to watch it. I'm Matt Dillon. He joined me this week, my friend and occasional uh, guest host here. Habit Meta, how are you, sir? Good. Thank you for having me, Matt. I'm excited I'm to be thrilled. here. thrilled. It's good it's to see you, too. Easy. Yeah, <laughs> I, and it, it feels like I know we're still doing things remotely, and it was great to get you, you in here, but it also, it you know, I've started to go out into the world a little bit more. I've been locked in my house since last March, but like yeah. uh, I went out, I went out and, and mostly I still wear a mask everywhere, even though they're not requiring it because I don't trust other people. <laughs> but uh, I, I got a couple of hugs. Uh, I went on a date. I wore a mask. I went to Esther's Follies. It was, it was healing. So uh, it's what- so good to have you here this week. What's going on with you right now? Uh, no, I was going to say I was, I've been going on bike rides, taking walks around where I live. It's been wonderful. And otherwise, no, it's been good. Uh, If anyone's watching on YouTube, please subscribe to Friendly Atheist while you're here. Just another tab. Go open it. Go do it. Thanks. Yes. Please check out uh, Friendly Atheist, the, the blog and everything else. Uh, half the, I, and I've said this before, you know, this is no secret. In the years that I was working on nonprofits, uh, it was basically let's go read everything that Hemet did this week <laughs> and we'll do news stories about it and we'll have discussions and stuff like that. So you have I been the touchstone it. for awesome. for us for <laughs> ages. I tell you what, let's not waste any time at all. Let's go straight to calls. Marlon in the Philippines, you're on the air with Hemet and Matt. How are you? How are you guys? I've been watching you, your YouTube videos, Matt. It's well, been welcome. really calming. <laughs> It says it says here you had a some sort of experience this morning that you think might be a miracle or something. You wanted to ask us about it. Yes, basically, I'm a Catholic, but my friend invited me to a Baptist church, and I have seen this pastor who declares himself the chosen one because I saw him literally ignite his hand on fire without even flinching and then he also did this food miracle at lunchtime with everyone having their hands up what what do you think is this so, some kind of divine intervention from so God? i'm wondering so you've got a baptist pastor and you say he declares himself the chosen one What does that mean? It means that he has a sign from God that this pastor received a portion of power from heaven. Yeah, I literally lit his hands on fire. Okay, so I'm getting. I'm gonna. I want to get to the hands on fire thing. I want to get the hands on fire thing. But what I'm going to say is. I'm not aware of any sort of biblical notion and certainly nothing consistent with my Baptist upbringing, which you're talking about a Baptist church, where a pastor would declare themselves a chosen one or to have power from God. In every instance I've ever heard of this, it's always been, as far as I can tell, an attempt to con areas where they think power like this has happened. So describe for us When you say he lit his hand on fire, describe for us as best you can and as quickly as you can what you saw. I saw him praying with his eyes closed and with his hands on his chest. And then when he snaps his fingers, literal fire blows out of his hands. It's like the Pentecost, but on the palms of his hands. True story. I was in a play when I was in middle school. Um, Hang on, go ahead. Go ahead, Hemet. I was in a play when I was in middle school where I played like a bad guy, and one of the special effects we had was literally a magic trick that if I, it, it was like a lighter in my hand, and if I went like this, it looked like my I was setting something on fire in my hand. I'm not saying that's what he did, but it's always interesting that when I hear about pastors who do these types of magic tricks, uh, I, and I've heard, by the way, pastors are 
uh, floating in the air like an inch, or they're showing you something on their phone, like some picture that is something from heaven or something like that. It is amazing to me that these self-described prophets or the chosen one or, or whatever they want to call themselves, this is the thing God has given them the power to do. Mind you, we are coming uh, through a pandemic right now. There's so much they could do if they had real power. And yet the power you're describing is a magic trick where he shows you his hand is on fire or something. I don't know why that's supposed to be convincing to all these people when there's so many things, if he actually had God ordained powers, he could be doing that really would be a miracle and not a magic trick, more or less. Yeah, I mean, I'm a I'm a magician. I've lit my hand on fire. If you Google, if you just go to Google and type in hand on fire, you will get a bunch of pictures of people with their hands on fire. You will get YouTube videos telling you how to safely set your hands on fire. You will get science videos showing, and the number of different ways to do it. There are, there are ways where you will have a, a fire resting in your palm that comes up. You'll have somewhere it looks like your hand is actually on fire due to a chemical. Um, there's lots of different ways to do it. I wonder, I'm really curious how soon it took after that fire trick before the collection plate was passed around. Okay, here's the part. Here's the part where Marlon is going to tell us why we're wrong about what we're saying. Go ahead. Matt, when when you were doing the skull plate, did your hands burn? Uh, when I did it, no. Did it was a trick. It was it was fake fire. It was just a, an illusion. Well, I've done it with real fire and no, my hand doesn't burn. And there's lots of ways to do it with chemicals, special effects and other things to make it look like it. But yes, I've had real fire and my hand doesn't burn. This is from the Philippines and it's like he declares himself some kind of modern day prophet. I, I understand that. But what I'm saying is the trick that he did if he's doing it through divine power, as my friend James Randi used to say, he's doing it the hard way because there are easier ways to do that trick. But as Hemet was pointing out, and this is a great point, if why would God give someone the power to set their hand on fire instead of giving them the power to heal people, to feed people? Uh, why, why just a quick trick that you can buy from a magic store? instead of something useful. Oh, this pastor multiplied food on the spot. Okay, Marlon, Marlon, yes. I'm trying to address your question. And when I, I raise this, yes. this problem of he did a, a shitty miracle that you can buy in most magic, magic shops, um, now without acknowledging it, yes. without saying anything else, you immediately go on to, he multiplied food on the table. I've done that before too. I, matter of fact, I'm putting together a magic show that is basically me copying the tricks of Jesus. I'm going to multiply food. I'm going to turn water to wine. If you want me to, I'll add turning my hand uh, in, <laughs> into fire on there because all of these are things that you can do with magic tricks. Why is it that the pastor that you're, you're talking about, who's been given, supposedly given power from God, can't do anything that a good magician could do or couldn't do? Uh, I, I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> that, that's what I saw. I mean, yeah, I was I get it, invited but... into this church. Yeah, I, I tell you, I cannot. I so I wasn't. Hang, hang on, Marlon. I wasn't. I wasn't there, and I didn't see it. So all I can do is give my opinion of what you described. But what you described, I don't find to be remotely miraculous. I don't find it to be remotely good evidence for anything. And in fact, I find it kind of cheesy. Um, that over and over again, I see videos all over the place of preachers and men of God all over the world doing easy, cheap magic tricks. And in some cases, they'll do some that are more complicated. But I, I don't understand how setting setting someone's hand on fire could be anything. But that's that's all I've got on that, Marlon. <laughs> It's also telling that it's it, he's not relying on the sermon. He's not relying on the Bible to convince people to take him seriously. He's relying on an illusion. So does that mean the miracles are fake? They are fake. Yes. I cannot prove that the miracles are fake, but that's the problem. Mm -hmm. If 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 there's no way to show that they're fake, but they haven't demonstrated that they're real, which one you think is more likely? And 
even if you can't decide which one's more likely, you shouldn't believe either. You should just say, I don't know what happened. I, I don't know what happened is the honest answer. Yep. To be exact. And, and I don't know either, Marlon. We're going we're gonna to move on to some other calls. I appreciate the call. I appreciate uh, the interesting stuff. Go watch, watch some more. See what you can find. Maybe you can get a, a, take a cell phone and actually record it the next time he sets it on fire. And maybe we can figure out exactly which trick he purchased. I guess I'm an atheist now. <laughs> well, I, I don't know that that's enough for anybody to, <laughs> to truly be an atheist. But certainly be more skeptical and, you know, if you see something that's amazing, ask yourself, what did I see? What can I say about it? What can I tell about it? Do I know how it was done? Because if the answer is, I don't know, then you certainly can't be in a position where you could say that was a miracle. All you can say is, I don't know what that was. I need more information. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Marlon. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. And... As we uh, as we head on down, yes, there are announcements to uh, make as well. I'm I'm shuffling things around. Uh, if you are watching us live on YouTube right now, there's a link below uh, YouTube for you to click to donate to the atheist community of Austin. 100% of your donations go directly to the ACA. They don't stop at Google or YouTube, or if they do, they don't take a cut of it. And you can find uh, merchandise. Uh, at our uh, link right there. It's bit.ly slash A-E-N merch. You can get your uh, coffee cups and t-shirts and things like that. In addition, you can become a member on YouTube uh, and that will get you custom uh, emojis and icons and things like that. And you can become uh, a member or join and support us through Patreon as well. If you prefer that, patreon.com slash the atheist experience. We have a couple of ways where you can interact with people involved in the in the shows and in the broader community and that's the atheist experience uh fan group and then there's also the atheist experience private fan group so there's axp fg and then there's axp pfg uh to get those out there there's also the aca discord but i want to see if we can't uh, get to some more callers here today um i've got pete in, in texas somewhere in texas pete you're you're on with matt and Hammett. how are you sir Hey, good. How are you guys doing? Good. Pretty, pretty good. And, 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 anyway, I'm sorry. Uh, hey, um, yeah, I'm calling from El Paso, Texas, and uh, I've been watching clips of your Atheist Experience show on YouTube uh, for quite some time, and I was wondering, uh, as far as you know, has anything you've done with this show made a positive, measurable difference in the world? Um, key, key word of my question being measurable. Um. And feel free, Hemant, to you can chime in too, even though it's not your show. But uh, yeah, well, I mean, Hemant's been working similarly. So the measurable thing is the hard part, and so I would say yes. But um, what I'm considering measurable is like how many people's minds have been changed. That's a measurable thing. We we don't know exactly because I haven't bothered to count it, but it's thousands and thousands of people who are embracing skepticism, who are abandoning superstition and religion. For example, you take that the last caller. I, I'm not, I don't, whether he identifies as an atheist or whatever is, is not really my concern, but the fact that he could have been potentially duped by a, a con artist, maybe, maybe it's real, but at a minimum, he could have been duped. And now he's going to be more skeptical about, about that. But there are people who email us on a regular basis to say, hey, thank you for what you've done on the show because it's taught me about skepticism and it's helped heal wounds in my family or it's created rift here. So what becomes measurable apart from like the number of people whose minds are changing? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I would, if I can jump in there, yeah, please. Like, like Matt said, um, I don't know what measure you want to use. I don't keep a tally count anywhere of people who have emailed me to say they've become an atheist because of what I wrote or what they heard or anything. I genuinely don't care. Um, but I do have, I, I have a whole bunch of emails from people who have written over the years who have said, you help me think about these things that I just accepted for a really long time, which is meaningful to me. Um, in addition to that, if you're looking for a different type of measurement, I can tell you people who have either chosen to go into politics or make donations to nonprofits or, uh, I mean, we've raised money for causes that we thought were important that people have given to. 
So, I, I mean, it depends on how you want to measure it. I, I mean, I think a lot of churches will say, well, you can measure our success by the number of baptisms or, you know, how many people we sent on mission trips. And I don't find either of those metrics particularly useful in saying how much of an actual positive impact they had. So, again, depends how you want to say measurable. But, I mean, I, I can point you to emails I've received. I can show you fundraisers we've done. Um, but, again, I'm not sitting here with a scorecard yeah. of how many atheists we've we've deconverted. And, and I'll add on that that, uh, you know, that's a measure as well. Um, over the years, we have raised and contributed a bunch of money to a bunch of organizations in, recovering from religion, um, Foundation Beyond Belief, others, in, and charitable organizations like Atheists Helping the Homeless, Humanists at Work, things like that. So th there are actual numerical financial aspects to what we've done. But it's really hard to quantify, hey, we sat around and we had a bunch of discussions about God and exactly how did that positively quantifiably measurably affect somebody i don't know i don't know that that's um that's something that's easy to do if i can also add on that there's i mean quantifiably because myself because some groups have been keeping track of how many open atheists have run for office because i think that's a a type of metric that would be interesting in terms of being out and public about your atheism not political party but being out and uh, out about it and that's gone up quite a bit over the past several years, I could give you specific numbers. But the point is, if I find that to be a useful term, I think there's a lot of other things that matter. What are they doing with their power if they get into elected office? I mean, there are people who might look at that and say, well, I don't like their politics. So right. I don't find that a positive. Yeah, this, this is where we're going to get to the point where Pete disagrees with us about somewhat about positive. But hopefully yeah, so that answers your question. You, so yeah, depends what you mean by positive, depends what you mean by measurable. Yeah. Is that, is that help, Pete? Yeah, no, it, yeah, yeah, it does. In, in terms of the measurable part, uh, yeah, no, you did a pretty good job of explaining it, both of you. Um, but yes, I actually was going to go off on a tangent, if you, if you got a minute or two, about uh, the positive. Of course, if I'm a theist and you guys are atheists, uh, of course, we're going to see things differently. And, um, yeah. and you know, you, you might say that, okay, well, you know, there's been these people who've been calling in and they're Christians and, you know, we finally got them to become free th thinkers and they turned they accepted atheism it's just made more sense to them and like was it positive though like whatever they went like did they have like a really terrible life when they were christians were they doing a lot of destructive things but now that they become atheists uh they become like better humanitarians or or i mean you know again that's going to be hard for you guys to answer about like no that. it's not no it's but not if i if i told you they did why would i mean would you say all right well i guess atheists have a point then if i told you they started volunteering more would that would that change anything you're saying here yeah i, I think that would make me feel a little bit better but you know uh, talking to a lot of my christian friends you know you know i discussed this question with them before i even came on the show and, and it was like you know, okay, no one's keeping a tally of this. You guys already said no one's keeping a tally. So, I mean, let's say that some Christian people became atheists and they're, like, just more laid back. They become partiers. They turn to drugs. And <laughs> a stretch, okay? But if you, if, if you could just humor me. Uh, uh, a you know. stretch, Pete. A stretch. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. Build, I, I your, build wanna, your straw man so I, I can burn it the fuck going. down in just a minute. Go ahead. I want to know about all these things I do. I'm sorry. What things you do for what? Like, like, what do you, are you saying? You I, use drugs or what? No, I'm the most boring, laid-back person ever. I'm just curious. What else do you think? Atheists I I've could... used drugs, Pete, but please keep building that straw man. I, I'm ready to light my hand on fire and burn it down. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I use drugs too, guys. Okay, yeah. then then why are you why are you saying what if people <laughs> turn to atheism and all of a sudden they're they're doing drugs and other stuff? Okay, so what? The thing is. Where, where we disagree about what's positive or not, what I want is, can you demonstrate something that is demonstrably positive and true that can only be achieved by being a Christian? Uh, can I answer your first question? What was my first question? Go ahead. As you guys were talking, you just said, so so what if, if it's, you know, drug, you know, these people have turned to drugs and you said, well, what, what, what difference would that make? And I said, well, you know, the, the difference could be that for the most part, when you talk about drugs, 
it's usually related with something that's negative. It's not like, hey, this guy got hooked on heroin, and man, he's become uh, so much more productive in life. He's helping his family grow, and things are really going no, well. No, 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 no. Actually, most of the time when you're talking about drugs, you're talking about weed. That's the most common illegal drug. You got a problem with people smoking weed? I don't. I've smoked, uh, I've smoked it. I'm not yeah. happy about it, but, but who uh, cares? It's okay. It, uh, you know, it's a, yeah. it's, it's a tiny percentage of people who are on addictive chemicals who are doing it in a destructive fashion. And that, that's not limited that's to non-theists. But I, going back to the question, though, you were saying that's if true. they become atheists and that's they start true, down this path I, of destruction. I'm getting, excuse me, I'm, I'm getting bombarded from two different things. And so Matt said something, and I'd like to address it. And now, how many, go ahead, uh, go ahead, address uh, Matt's thing. Uh, and I, now I'm already even forgetting, like, uh, Matt, you said so, oh, oh yeah, you said it's a small, small percentage, and that's not true. I know that it's not true, and I'll tell you one reason I do know it. Yesterday here in El Paso, you know El Paso's right on the uh, border of war is Mexico. Um, I, I recently moved to Texas, um, and uh, I got a tour, my roommate's ex-roommate's husband is a border patrol agent who's getting ready to retire and he gave us a three-hour tour kind of like gilligan's island and uh he educated us so much about all this drug stuff and no it's not marijuana in fact that even came up it's just it's uh, ironic that you would mention that because he said no it's it is so uh, no all the yeah. what are we talking pete, about anymore pete, you, so pete i, I apologize Evidently, you misunderstood. You didn't say at the beginning, what if people start turning to drugs and, and clearly say, I'm talking about addictive, problematic drugs. You just said, turn to drugs. I'm saying people turn to drugs frequently, and some of them are the problem. You, you don't get to just only limit it to the problem, and you don't get to pretend that the problem is only limited to non-theists. Yes, there are drugs that are a problem. Yes, there are people who are addicted. It's like 38% of all adults have dealt with some sort of uh, abuse issue. Um, and what's the most common drug that's problematic? Alcohol. Alcohol is the most common drug that is problematic. It is legal. It is what people use on a regular basis. Instead of talking about weed or heroin, we should have gone to alcohol because it's legal. It's used in church services. It is addictive and it causes problems and it results in countless deaths. And it has nothing to do with whether someone is a theist or an atheist. So can we get back on track? Sure, we can, we can get back on track. So what is the what is the true and demonstrably positive thing that can only occur from becoming a Christian? All right, I'm, I'm trying to wrap my mind around that. So what is the only true and positive demonstrably? Can you benefit? can you name a true and demonstrably positive benefit that can only occur by being a Christian? Is there something that you can do that is true and good that I can't do as an atheist? If, if if you're talking about someone who is a true follower of Christ, and when I say true, I mean someone who's really born again, which I know you know what that means, Matt, but uh, not everyone else does. But if it's someone like that, once they have truly surrendered their lives to Jesus Christ, they become a new person with a new heart and new desires, and they can live a life that is very productive and more beneficial to the world because they're not affected by sin as much as like a guy like you, or me, or Hamed. <laughs> I haven't heard I haven't heard an answer to your question, Matt. Yeah, I haven't heard an answer to my question either. Sh name something that is true and positive that a Christian can do that I can't do. Dedicate their life to Christ. That is not, you can't demonstrate that that is true and positive because I think that's a negative yeah. and I think it's a fiction. Just, okay, d then demonstrate that it is true and positive for one to dedicate one's life to Christ. This will be great. Yeah, it will be great. Let me tell you about a, uh, a guy I met. No, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> no, Pete. I don't want a story. I want you to make the argument that dedicating one's life to Jesus is is something that is true, that there is a Jesus and something to dedicate to, and that it is positive. 
it, it requires a story. And don't say it doesn't. Listen. But your entire question was implying that if someone's an atheist, they are not doing something that is good and true and positive or anything like that. And our entire argument to you is it depends how you want to define those words. It, you mentioned drug use. It depends what type of drugs we're talking about. I could point you to people who started volunteering be, or who be, decided to give themselves to others because they felt this is the only life that they can live so that they got to make the most of it right now. I just posted the other day about an atheist who found out that he's living with ALS. He's he's not going to be around for much longer. And he was grappling with the question of what do I do? I don't believe there's an afterlife. What can I do with my time that I have left? Because there's nothing else out there for me. I don't believe in an afterlife. And he was talking about all the ways he was trying to make sure he was helping other people, the way he was trying to give back to his community as best he could. That to me seems like a demonstrable thing for an atheist to do because they're not waiting for an afterlife. It's not that religious people couldn't also give themselves to their communities or what have you. But this is what he was doing as an atheist. And he felt compelled to do it because he knew there was an expiration date in the future to his life. And after that, it was done. Um, but if your argument is that stuff doesn't exist, it does exist. I mean, there's countless examples of it, but it, it genuinely sounds like no answer we give here is going to satisfy your claim that there's nothing positive that an atheist can contribute here. Now, I'm, I'm going to get back to your question, but before that, just out of curiosity, you're talking about David Warnock? Yes. Yeah, David uh, called me on the phone uh, about two or three weeks ago. You can confirm it with him. We had a long talk. He's a nice guy. I donated some money to his cause. Anyway, um, I am going to tell you a story, and if you want to hang up on me, you can. But it's only I am, I am, and I'm going to explain why. I, I, I want. It's important that you understand this. A story is just an anecdote. There's no way to verify any of it. There's no way you can demonstrate the truth of something by telling me a story about another person. That does not demonstrate the truth of anything. Do you at least understand that? I do understand that, but we're not inside. Good. That's why we're not doing the story, Pete. No, that's we should. Are, are you afraid of the story? I mean, come on. No, Pete, I'm not afraid of anything except wasting time. And for you, you just admitted that there's no way your story can demonstrate the truth of the claim. If, if your story cannot do that, then it would be a waste of time for me to let you tell the story. You got to find a different way to demonstrate truth. It's not my fault, Pete, that you believe something is true that you cannot demonstrate. A 90 second story is going to kill you guys. People no, but a you not understanding and smugly trying to preach on my show is not going to kill any of us either. And me hanging up on you isn't going to kill anybody either. Learn how to make the case for something being true because you just admitted that what you're about to do cannot demonstrate the truth of the proposition, and therefore we will not be wasting any time on it. On that note, there's more announcements, by the way. I forgot that in addition to the, uh, the Atheist Experience fan group and, and private fan group, there's also a new Facebook group that is Atheist versus Theist Debates Group. Uh, which we have a new graphic up for right there. It's XP fan debates right there. You can go in and get your argument on. And maybe Pete can just join that group right there and he can tell whatever story he wants. And other people can explain to him why telling an anecdote is not in any way a demonstration of the truth of your claim. Uh, also, in addition, we had talk Ethan earlier today and a uh, really good episode. You should go back and watch it because Objectively Dan, who's a new team member on Talk Ethan, and Objectively Dan is also on Truth Wanted on Friday nights, but Jimmy Snow from Mr. Atheist was here uh, as well. The two of them did that show today. And in between Talk Heathen and Atheist Experience, Nonprofits, which was recorded on Wednesday, that airs at three o'clock, new hosts, new segments. And if you're not familiar with these other programs from the ACA, you can go to tiny.cc slash AEN podcasts. That is your one-stop destination for all of our shows as audio only podcasts. So if you're tired of looking at my face or watching what expression I make or anything else, you can watch all, or you can listen to all these as just audio only podcasts. And you can find all the other shows there as well. And the important thing is that this program, all of those other programs and all of that content are here because of an incredible volunteer, volunteer crew 
uh, who can put themselves up on the screen right now. They are busy Woo! taking calls. The cat is always the one in charge. They're they're taking calls. They're screening people. They are engaging in all of the activities. And I don't want to forget. I don't. Let's not forget that. Yes, those are the people that you're going to see behind the scenes. But if you're over on YouTube right now, there are a bunch of moderators over there who you didn't see who are working their butts off. So please be kind to our moderators because I'll nuke all of you from orbit long before I get rid of a single moderator uh, or, or ba not back them up. But all right. That is officially all of uh, all of the regular announcements there. We have more callers. Um, let's see. Here's an interesting one. David in California says, God can't be proven through science, but can through history and experience. So welcome, David. How are you? I'm doing great, Matt. How are you doing? I'm all right. I'm, I'm glad uh, Hemet's here because, I, you know, you, did you hear the last call with Pete? Yeah, I think that was a repeat. Well, I, the, the reason I'm asking is because... Um, I, I, you're going to claim that God can't be proved through science. I have no idea if that's true or not. I just don't think it has. Um, but you're going to claim that it can be God can be proved through history and experience. And I, I want to caution you that if it just turns into stories that can't be verified, that's not going to prove anything. It, that's the part Pete got right. Right. Well, I'm looking at results more than anything. Results. What do you like? Like, what oh, do you mean results? Why? Well, I think that Christianity is far more fair and establishes equality, whereas science can't do those things. It's actually the opposite. But Christianity is superior in the, in the results that it produces in human beings and their lives. That's not true, but what does that have to do with it being true? Like, yeah, in case you're not understanding. Why so it's possible that being a Christian could make someone feel really good, even if Christianity wasn't true, right? Uh, yeah, there's lots of things that make people feel good. There's lots of people that yeah. do things bad and feel good. Okay, uh, so, no, hang on. Don't get, don't get ahead. David, this is easy. So it's also possible that if someone believed Christianity was true, it could make them a better person, even if Christianity wasn't true, right? Uh, no, I just had a little discussion with Jimmy about this over at the talk, Ethan. No, no, Dave. I, so, a, hang on. I, I heard you on talk, Ethan. I, the question I asked was, I is it possible that Christianity, if, 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 that let's imagine Christianity is not true, but someone believes it's true, it's possible that that could make someone a better person, believing that it's true even if it's not. And you say that's not the case? Well, I was just going to say that Jimmy claimed that he was a better person now that he's an atheist. Okay, so I don't agree. So, uh, well, I what Jimmy? Hang on, David, stop. What Jimmy was saying is that he had a drug problem and he's better. And you said that you don't think he's better, and he said, "Fuck you." Now, before I say "fuck you" and get rid of you, will you answer my question? Is it possible that someone could believe any religion, including Christianity? and believe in the tenets of that religion and have that belief make them a better person, even if the religion itself is not true. Is that possible? It's possible that you could be a more amicable person. Is that what you're saying? If you believed that the religion is true, is it possible that that belief alone can make you act in a better way, even if the religion is not true? Uh, no, that's kind of vague to me. I don't, I don't, I don't. Yeah. This is okay. David, I'm going to make this really simple. What you, is it possible that if someone believed a God was watching them, that it might make them behave better, even if a God wasn't watching them? Hasn't worked for me. No. Okay, we're done. We're done because you're not going to answer questions honestly because the answer to that question is an obvious yes. Of course, you can impact people to be better through lies. That's what parents do to children. And the fact that you can't recognize that means that this call is now over. Thanks. That was a fun history lesson. Yeah. 
See, we, we convince children to behave better by believing in Santa. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, no, I have little ones. And yeah, it's a constant uh, going through all those things about what I was fed in terms of religion. And now what I talk to my kids about in terms of Santa, in terms of things like that. It's like, I need you to behave. We'll get around to the right reason for doing it, but you're they're not necessarily old enough to understand the right reason, the moral reason for doing things. Yep. But we need to get there first, and then we can talk about those things. So, uh, But the point being, like, if the question is Christianity, the, the first thing that guy said was Christianity makes things more fair or equal. It's like, have you looked out the window? Have you yeah. seen what Christianity does to people these days? I mean, equality and fairness is not anywhere in that ballpark. Yeah, D David had called in to talk heathen and um, was not particularly the most honest interlocutor. And there it's were a number talking. of questions that I would like to ask. But uh, unfortunately, if we can't even recognize, if we can't even recognize right. that it's possible to convince someone to be a better person, even if the thing that you use to convince them isn't ultimately true, I mean, then you just missed the lesson from Santa Claus. You just missed right. the lesson from the fact that all those other religions you don't believe in have inspired people to do things, including good things. The problem right. is, is that religions also inspire people to do bad things. And it's a lot easier to get them to do bad things when you can convince them it's all good. Yeah. And meanwhile, uh, atheism, which isn't something you convert to, unlike a, a couple of callers ago, yeah. Uh, doesn't have any tenets and doesn't have any way. There's nothing within atheism that could ever get someone to kill another human being right. or enslave another human being on behalf of atheism. That's not possible. However, that is possible for a number of different religions. Mm -hmm. All amen. right. So we got, uh, yes, I'm good with an amen all the time. Danny in Florida wants uh, to talk to us and ask some advice. So welcome, Danny. Hey, Matt. Hey, Matt. How you doing today? Hey. Excellent. Doing well, thanks. All right. Great. Um, okay. Uh, I'm calling pretty much to speak with Matt. And Matt, I know you're not a psychiatrist, but um, I really um, admire your intelligence and uh, your experience. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask him, hopefully he can help me out a little bit. Um, what kind of transpired is um, I've converted or talked my girlfriend in – into being an atheist, and she was pretty much a uh, Christian prior to that. And um, what's happened is um, it kind of um, um, caused more harm than good. Um, as no, it didn't. No, it didn't. No, it absolutely did not. I, I know what you're getting ready to. I know what you're getting ready to say. She's now depressed. Uh, that she's not going to get to go to heaven and see her family and stuff like that, right? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, I, I will have thoughts here, and I'm sure Hemet has thoughts here as well. My thoughts are really simple. It is, it is not her conversion to atheism that caused this depression. It is the lie from Christianity that caused this depression. Mm -hmm. Christianity built up a false expectation that everything's going to be fine and rosy someday. And after we're dead, we're all going to get to spin to eternity together, just blissfully running through the Elysian fields and enjoying and singing praises and everything else. It's as if someone told your girlfriend that she was going to inherit a billion dollars. And today she found out that that's not the case. It is not the fault of the truth that she feels bad. It is the fault of the lie that she feels bad. And getting to recognize that, she can also come to the recognition that this is a gift. Because not only does she have the truth now, as opposed to the lie, or at least at a minimum, she is not believing something without good reason. But she now gets to recognize that she has exactly one life. If there is an afterlife, it's a bonus that we don't know anything about and nobody can demonstrate. She has one life, and that means that you're more likely to treat people better the first time. It means that you're going to make amends with your family members rather than bearing a grudge forever. It is difficult, and it will be painful and annoying and depressing for her while she's transitioning through this. But the best thing for her to do is to interact with other non-believers who have gone through the same thing and who have, uh, are going through the same thing now and potentially reaching out to something like 
recovering from religion, where there are counselors there who can help and answer these questions, and something like the Secular Therapist Project. But it is not the fault of her becoming an atheist that she is depressed. It is not the fault of becoming an atheist any more than, you know, hey, if you, if you felt like I'm going to be rich and then you find out you're not, that, that, that example that I used before of the billionaire, or maybe, maybe you really thought that somebody loved you or that, you know, this was going to be your soulmate and you found out this is not my soulmate and you find out there's no such thing as a soulmate, now all of a sudden you have a better understanding of reality so that the next relationship you enter into, you do it on the proper grounds. You do it going into it, knowing what to expect. Christianity and religions have done a terrible job of teaching human beings how to deal with death. Death is an inevitable, unavoidable part of life. And if we learned and were taught how to deal with it better to begin with, we wouldn't have the fear and misery that we have about losing our loved ones. And we wouldn't have this, oh, I can't wait to see you in fantasy land. But I want, I want Hammett to get into because I've, I've said this probably 20 times. No, I, I love that answer. The only thing I would add to that is it sounds like what she's upset about is change more than the atheism. And part of that is, look, when you change anything, if you she left religion she's now an atheist. That is a tough transition for a lot of people, especially if you're coming from a very conservative, very fundamentalist type of Christianity. But change is always hard. The answer isn't that there's a problem with atheism. The answer is it's new. There's a lot of aspects and letting go of all that stuff she was believing for so long. It takes a while to come to terms with that. And again, anyone who's listened to this show knows that when you're an atheist, like Matt said, there can be compelling reasons to, to make this life a better one. But that all of this is not going to fall into place for your girlfriend immediately. Sometimes it might be reading enough, more books. It might be listening to more people, like Matt said, talking to other atheists, talking to the secular therapist, what have you. It takes a little bit of time to figure out how to deal with your entire world coming out from under you because you just realized they were feeding you lies. And so it's the depression isn't, the issue. She should have someone to talk to. And my advice, and again, I'm saying this not as a therapist, is that it really will help to talk to other people who have been there, who have gone through it, who could tell you what the end of the tunnel looks like there, um, because that will help her come to terms with reality. But otherwise, no, uh, what Matt said there about the problem here isn't atheism. The problem is all the lies she was fed beforehand and realizing none of that stuff was real. Does that help, Danny? Yeah, that, that helps a lot. Um, you know, I, I was, you know, I, of course, think along all those lines. And, um, you know, myself, I can't understand how a person way more intelligent than I could, could believe in such a thing. I, I, it, it's just beyond. Because it's not about intelligence. So. Yeah, but if you're part if you're part of a really strong church culture, there are reasons that draw you in there that make you want to believe that stuff for reasons that, yeah, have nothing to do with how smart someone is. There are other reasons you are drawn into that. And when you realize it is based on these premises of lies, it, it takes a lot of work mentally to, to step away from that and realize, you know, how do you make sense of the world if the things you've been taught since Sunday school or at home were not real. How do you make sense of that? How do you deal with all these people who you are probably very close to who believe something that you now find dishonest? I mean, it's a lot. It's a lot for anyone to deal with. And that is really hard, especially at first. And that doesn't even getting that's not even getting into relationships you have with people who belong in that group still and trying to step away from all that because for so many people even when they have those doubts they can't leave church because they're so tied up in that culture so yeah i'm i'm not surprised it's upsetting but it's not the fact that she is now an atheist that is the problem here yeah it's it's when i say it's not about intelligence um I th there's a quote it may be it, it may be a quote from Shermer, but i might be getting this wrong that's um Smart people are often very good at rationalizing things they came to believe for not smart reasons. 
And so you can be incredibly intelligent and you can be incredibly knowledgeable. And if you, be, if you become convinced of something for bad reasons, you, and it becomes something that's cherished, that's a part of you, you can then spend forever defending it with even worse reasons as long as you're capable of doing that kind of rationalization. So this is not a thing about uh, IQ or, or smarts in any colloquial sense. Okay. As, okay. You be there for her. You help her out as she's going through that process. And, and hopefully you can guide her to some resources that will help her out too. You know, I, I have been, and I've, I went to the, um, to telling her, you know, like, uh, Matt said earlier, because I've, I've heard him say this before about this is the only life you have to live. And if you, you need to make the best of it while you're here and, and do the right things, so on and so forth. And I think, I think that's helped her a little bit. Um, I, I, I just have to bear with her, I guess, and, and, and be there for her and, and help her get through the process. And I really thank you guys for picking up my call, and I, and I really appreciate your advice, and I hope you guys have a great day. Absolutely. You too, and that's just good relationship advice, period. Thanks, Danny. Make sure you just give it time and be supportive uh, because it, for okay. almost everybody, it will, in fact, get better over time. Okay. Thank you very much, you guys. Have a great day, okay? Cheers. You too, Danny. Mm -hmm. That's, um, you know, you and I have heard that story uh, a bazillion D1 times. I'll just make up a number. Yeah. Um, and we've and heard it from pastors. I mean, if you're talking about going from one extreme to the other, I, I mean, if you're talking about going through that depression and how tough it is, maybe the people, at least from my experience, who have had to deal with the difficulty of that more than anybody are people who literally dedicated their lives to promoting those lies because they genuinely believe them pastors priests who decided i don't believe this stuff anymore and when they leave i mean uh, julia sweeney does this in letting go of god where she mm -hmm. talks about um when she started having those doubts it wasn't just about god it's trying to recalibrate everything you knew including like well then how are the planets up in the air right like and how do you deal with that because there's so many things that you just attributed to god and if you take god out of the picture it's like i mean i feel i don't know if this is the right analogy but it's like when you become a vegetarian or something and you do that for ethical reasons or you go vegan for ethical reasons you start having to question every food decision, clothing decision that you're making, even things yeah. you weren't thinking about because you didn't realize it was affected. And I mean, it's one thing if you believe it very strongly and you're willing to go through that transition, the bumpy transition process. But when you're not really expecting it, which I think for a lot of people, atheism is that where I didn't want to be it, but I think this is where the right. evidence goes. It's, it's not something you volunteered and signed up to do. You're just like, wait, this, if this is real, then like all this other stuff has to start making sense. And you realize, you know, it, it's realizing my parents lied to me and it wasn't intentional, but that is what you grew up with. And this priest or pastor that you loved was lying to you right. and it wasn't intentional. They're not bad people, but they were wrong about this stuff. And you got to redo all of that stuff. What a difficult journey for anyone to go through. But I mean, and I'm genuinely jealous of this now because... I left religion like more than 20 years ago, and there are so many amazing resources now that didn't exist when I changed. And it's kind of, if you're looking for it and you know what to look for, it, it can really help you with that process. Yeah. And by the way, uh, Hemet not only left religion, but wrote a book about how he sold his soul on eBay. Tell everybody about that real quick so they can uh, go. The uh, short version is I basically visited a bunch of Christian churches saying, you know, I've never experienced this myself. I've heard about it. I mean, I, I, I live in America. I know what Christianity is like, but it's secondhand. And so I ended up visiting a whole bunch of mostly evangelical Christian churches, but different types, all black church, evangelical mega church, house church. And a lot of them, are promoting seeker services. A lot of them are specifically reaching out to atheists saying, we, we are doing this sermon for you to bring you into the fold. So it's like, all right, well, I'm your target audience. I will go to your church. And yeah, I sold my soul on eBay is basically what I learned going to all these churches 
and whether any of them were convincing. And and while I'm an atheist, that's not really a spoiler. Um, some of the things they do to, to try to draw you in is I can see why it's compelling to so many people. And until you see that and you witness it firsthand, which at least speaking for myself, I had not experienced it firsthand. You can see how tough it could be to leave any of those places too. We've uh, we got some more callers here today. Uh, Richard in California wants to talk about how water has a collective conscious. Oh, this should be fun. Well, welcome, Richard. How are you? How are you doing? Good. Uh, pretty good. Uh, what? Tell us I, I'm not aware that water has anything that could be conscious at all, let alone a collective conscious. So, so how do we get to there? Uh, Dr. Iyamoto was a physicist from Japan, and uh, he wrote a book about it. So what? Okay. I, I, I have a gun. I have a, a pamphlet up here with all kinds of n pseudoscience, batshit crazy stuff that people have written all the time. Uh, what I asked was, how do we, how do, how do we get to demonstrate this? Not how did, how did you hear about it? Uh, Dr. Emoto was, uh, it was given to me uh, at the Theosophical Society in Ojai. Still didn't answer the question. Gwyneth yeah. Paltrow has a whole website full of this type of stuff. It doesn't mean any of it's true. I mean, you can have people with degrees saying crazy things. It doesn't mean they're right. Yeah, I, I'm only going to ask this one more time. How do we demonstrate that water has consciousness? Okay, so water molecules look like snowflakes underneath the microscope. And there are all types of different patterns of snowflakes. And so his experiment was he put a word next to a glass of water, put in uh, like a turkey baster, pull out a sample of water, look underneath the microscope after about five minutes. And if it was a positive word, the snowflake was radiating and, and magnified and reaching for more light. And if you put a negative word next to the water, he put the turkey baster in, pull it out, look, look underneath the microscope. And the water molecules will be fractured. What? What? I'm so curious what journal this was published in. <laughs> so the water was responding to the words. Uh -huh. You're talking about Dr. Emoto, right? Dr. Iamoto, yes. Yeah. I Iamoto. Oh, I thought you were talking about Masaru Emoto. Uh, Dr. Iamoto. He's dead now. So, okay. Well, it'd, it'd be really cool to get him on on the air and have a conversation with him. But it'd be it would be really cool, except that I've heard this story before about water molecules and putting up words next to them, and you know when they freeze and they form certain crystals. Um, my understanding is that this has been debunked as pseudoscience. Have have there been any peer reviewed studies that confirmed uh, this at all? The word you just used. The word you use, pseudoscience? Yes. Chiropractic medicine falls underneath that. I agree that yes. a good I agree that a good chunk of chiropractic medicine falls underneath pseudoscience and it should not be called medicine and it should not be used for any treatment. I agree. Thank you. Anything else? Yeah, yeah. So like Reiki, Reiki, uh, you know, the, the heat. Yep, Reiki is absolute bullshit. So is reflexology and a number of things. All of these things you're referencing are just as bullshit as water with consciousness. Like, okay, so you're, you're calling it bullshit, but you don't know that it's bullshit. Oh, yes, I do. You're, See, yeah. I, I know that it has absolutely continually failed to demonstrate any sort of efficacy. Now, that doesn't mean that it's not true. But when I say it's bullshit, what I mean is people keep claiming that it's real and no one has been able to demonstrate that it can actually do what they say they can do. I'm that's going back true, to That's my... true for homeopathy, Reiki, et cetera. I want That's to go back to my question is. where this guy publishes a book. Anyone can publish a book. I say this as someone who has published a book. Where was this paper of his, his conscious water consciousness paper published? Yeah. Who is looking at it? Who is giving it a stamp of approval here? It's irrelevant. Oh. It's so not irrelevant. It's, Anyone it's really can not. publish a book with any crap inside. There's entire businesses built on crap. But well, science is, specifically, is where's the peer review here? 
Is it fiction or nonfiction? Is what? Lord of the Rings fiction or nonfiction? Is what? Is what fiction or nonfiction? Fiction or nonfiction? If you okay, there's there's a thing where your audio is ducking. So if you try to talk while I'm talking, I'm not going to hear a thing you say. What are you asking me? Whether or not it's fiction or nonfiction? Is Lord of the Rings fiction or nonfiction? I took you off speaker, so that takes away the echo. Good. You should have never had me on speaker. I should hang up on you just for having me on fucking speaker. Lord of the Rings is fiction. What does that have to do with anything? I guess, it doesn't have anything. I guess it doesn't have anything to do with anything. We'll just move on to another call. Yeah. All right. Uh, Mark in California, thank you so much for waiting. You're on with him and Matt. Hi, you guys. How are you doing? Thanks for having me on. It says here that you believe everybody's going to hell who's not saved. That's exactly right. But th- th- that's just what the uh, screener wanted me to come up with a topic, and that's the first thing that came to my mind. I'll talk about anything you guys want to talk about. It's your show. No, no, no. I, I, I'm curious about that. So um, I, I, I'd like to know, I guess the first question is, uh, well, you say everybody's going to hell who's not saved. What, what, what must one do to be saved? How do we tell if somebody's saved? Well, that's very simple. Um, in the Bible, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, tells you that, if you uh, believe that Jesus died and shed his blood for your sins and he was buried and was uh, resurrected on the third day and that this is uh, what's written in Scripture and you, if you believe it, that's called faith. Faith in what you cannot see, faith in the gospel. And if you have that, then the Holy Spirit goes into you and you're saved. You're locked in yeah. for eternity. Nobody can, nobody can take that away from you. That's born again. Uh, okay. So... That's, that's, that's the category for who's going to hell or not. Um, are you okay with the, with the idea that, for example, uh, under your model, Mark, I'm assuming I'm not sure if I go to hell because I was at one point a born again Christian. And now of course I'm not. And I have pastor friends of mine who think that I'm still going to heaven because they believe once saved, always saved. And then I have other friends of mine who are pastors who think I'm going to hell just out of curiosity. Well, Best guess, what do you think? Am I going to hell? How do you know that you were born again? Well, What's your testimony. I, I was a sincere believer who turned over my life to Christ and believed the same thing. The people in my church thought that I was saved. I thought I was saved. That, um, no, that doesn't make you. That doesn't, now, are you, gonna, are you just going to fucking interrupt me or not? I'm sorry. What I said was, I sincerely believed that I was born again, as did the people who were surrounded me. I know that's not proof, but there's no other way. There's no way for you to demonstrate that you're saved. There's no way for anyone to demonstrate that anybody's saved. And within Christianity, the notion that you could demonstrate your salvation to another human being is anathema because only God knows whose names are written in the book of life, right? That's not true. That is not true. Oh. You know that you're saved. You can know that you're saved. No, 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 no. You're not listening. You're not listening, Mark. I, am- I said you. I said you cannot demonstrate it to another person. If you don't believe in Scripture, you have no faith, and you're not saved. Period. That's how Mark, you're not saved. Mark, you don't believe it. How, saved, Mark, period. Mark, how can you demonstrate? Man, it's like you don't even want to listen. How can you demonstrate to another person that you are saved? You're doing all the talking, you don't give me. Okay, Go if you're going to fucking interrupt me every time I ask, I start a sentence, I'm going to just hang up. I'm asking you a question. How can you demonstrate to someone else that you are saved? I can demonstrate to myself that I'm saved. That's not my fucking question, Mark. That's what I say when I say you are not listening to me. You will not listen to me. <laughs> let me let me talk without interrupting me. I tell you what, no, go away. You're not listening to me. Go rewind it. Listen, because you are not answering the question I asked. You are answering the question you wanted to answer. I said, how can you demonstrate to someone else that you are saved? And you wanted to talk about how you can prove it to yourself. I don't give a fuck how you can prove it to yourself. That's called self-deception. Goodbye. I am amazed that a guy like that comes in without a question, just wants to proselytize 
And that's the script he's working with. Like, in his head, he has to think, yep, this is gold. You've never heard this before. Let me tell you what it means to be saved. It's like, that. why would you think that is convincing to anybody? You had a minute to talk. He did. And he used the same boring, stale, useless Christian script that so many people use. It's it's such a bad marketing campaign. I had good. I had questions waiting. I wanted to know a how 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 do you get saved? B how can you know you're saved? B how can you or C how can you demonstrate that you're saved to somebody else? And then the most important question: Does he think this is a good system? Because if he thinks I'm going to hell, right. is he okay with that? Do, am I deserving of it? Are we I, all deserving? There were I lots of questions. Wanted- I would have also wanted to know what other, how many other Christians he thinks are, who would also say they are saved, are hellbound because they don't fit his definition of being saved. But like you said, you had a definition, you fit it. Yep. Many other Christians would say the same thing. And I have no doubt he thinks they're going to hell because they're not true believers. Uh, it goes into the whole no yeah. true Scotsman sort of categorization. It's frustrating because there were good questions to be asked and a good opportunity there, but he wouldn't listen. Instead of answering, here's a big tip to everybody. The, there's nothing that's going to frustrate or irritate me more than if I ask a question and you answer some other question. Please, I, I'm, I'm very careful about s- choosing my words carefully to ask the question that gets that is designed to get to the point that we want to actually address. Why would I'm a guy happy like that call that? in and yeah. say, I don't, I just said something to the screener about hell because I just wanted to get more or less face to face with you. And then he has nothing. Yeah. It's just a preachy pr- pitch. Like, I why suspect, why bother? Yeah, I suspect. Um, so it's like the, the caller before who was like, Oh, are you afraid of a story? No, dumbass. I've been doing this for 16 years. I've let plenty of people tell stories. The stories aren't particularly productive. Right. Um, what's, what's here? The real question is, are you afraid to answer the questions that I'm asking? Because that happens every stinking week. And this is every the thing week. about when you talk to apologists, when you talk to these Christians who try to be missionaries about telling their story, about preaching to other people, no part of that involves, well, what happens when your story fails? because someone interrupts it because they have a yeah. problem with something you said that's not in the class it's always just let me preach to you for a little while and then you will i don't know let this osmos into your mind it's like no 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 it's like those if you ever read a christian apologetics book where they're just telling their personal story or making an explanation and it's like no 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 don't go past the first sentence i have a problem with your first premise let's go back they never seem prepared for that one yeah, I've got, uh, here we go. I'm, I want to go to uh, Sharon in Illinois. Thanks for waiting. Whoops, I clicked the button, but it didn't do the thing. There you go. Wait a minute. Now I have uh, two people on. That would be a mistake. We don't want callers yeah. talking to each other. There we go. Sharon in Illinois, you're on. Thank you for waiting. Yes, hello. Hi. Hey. Yeah, um, you know, so I'm calling in um, because, you know, I think from what I understand, uh, a lot of atheists kind of look at um, the conscience as just being contained within the brain and operates like a wet robot, which you've probably heard a million trillion times. Um, And I would like to ask how you think that conscience and reason can just be, you know, come about with a bunch of chemicals and um, how chemicals could have organized um, thought and reason. Okay. So what you're asking me is to, to prove that the, the consciousness is, is merely a product of a material brain. Right. Um, I, I don't have to prove that it's merely a product of a material brain. It is, in fact, demonstrably a product of a material brain. If you think it's more or requires more than a material brain, then the burden of proof is on you to demonstrate that. I'm not asserting that there isn't something more. My position is that until such time as you've demonstrated that there is something more, I don't have a good reason to believe there's something more. It doesn't matter whether we have an explanation for consciousness. It doesn't matter whether we know how chemicals in a brain result in consciousness at all. 
we could be completely ignorant about we we could not even know that there is a brain but if your view is that the material can't do it on its own you have to demonstrate that and show what more there is well you know it's i i think the the conscience is obviously stumped many 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 scientists and um they haven't absolutely been able to prove how chemicals can actually develop intelligent thought but you're not going after what he's saying it's stumped them because they haven't figured out the mechanism it hasn't stumped them because they think there's something supernatural at play here um well you can label it as supernatural or you can label it as fact um no. No. no 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 that's not even close to a dichotomy Yes, yes, it's true. You could label it supernatural or you could label it as fact. I wish that was a dichotomy. I wish it was the best. That would be the best dichotomy ever. There's facts and then there's bullshit. So here's the thing. Well, the fact the fact that scientists don't have a, a good understanding and an explanation for consciousness does not mean that it's reasonable to conclude there must be something more than the material. That's you have to demonstrate. How can you demonstrate that, Sharon? Well, it's not reasonable to believe that chemicals can think. Can, but you think Sharon, it's Sharon, are you ever going to answer the question that you've actually been asked, or are you going to keep deflecting with bullshit? Well, I'm, first of all, I don't talk bullshit. You, you are. Uh, that doesn't describe. That doesn't describe um, an intelligent conversation. You're not having an intelligent conversation. I've asked. I've I've, I've pointed out okay. where the burden of proof rests. And you are basically saying that because scientists haven't been able to explain this, therefore, it's reasonable to conclude that there's something more than the material. And I'm explaining to you that that is not actually a reasonable conclusion. Well, there's no I don't think any of us can totally conclude because you can't put your hands on consciousness. You're not listening. You can touch. I am listening, but you, you are. No, no. All right. You are not thinking. Because I didn't see whether or not you can touch consciousness is, is irrelevant. Whether or not you can completely or absolutely conclude anything is irrelevant. Neither of those things have anything to do with what I said. What, here's what I said, Sharon. Let me make this really easy. How can you demonstrate mm -hmm. that consciousness requires something more than the material? How can, you how can anybody demonstrate that it doesn't? Goodbye, you dishonest <laughs> interlocutor. Uh, you, you refuse to answer the question. I pointed out before that nobody is claiming that it doesn't. Nobody's demonstrating that it doesn't. For you to, to, to come back and say, well, you can't prove it's material only is irrelevant. That is a shifting of the burden of proof. If you think it's more than material, then you have to demonstrate that. And what you've just done is admitted that you can't because instead you tried to shift the burden of proof again that I can't, I started out saying that I can't, but what I am saying is hey. if you're professing certain things. If you're professing that God doesn't exist, if you're professing- That's not what I'm professing, Sharon. If you would ever, I'm gonna shut up and let Hemet take this because if you would ever fucking listen, you would stop misunderstanding and misrepresenting everything in the reverse. Well, I, I don't think fucking is what we're doing here. Uh, that's not uh, even an intelligent word. All right, you pedantic, <laughs> obnoxious person. We're not fucking. You, you and I are definitely not fucking, Sharon. <laughs> Was that confusing for you? Right, and, and God, God help us. But, but, but do you understand that there's a colloquial use of the word fucking where it is, an, where it is used as an interjection? Uh, I'm aware of what people, this, how this, people distort language, absolutely. No, 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 not distort language. Language is our plaything. You see, I get to say fuck as much as I want, and I can tell you to fucking go away. I can't believe I just got invited to a non-threesome. I know. Hey, Hemet and I aren't fucking, me and the caller aren't fucking, nobody's doing it, so it's weird. So back to the issue, maybe we just, I, I am going to take more calls. Um, but it's like, this is so frustrating. I, I literally just got done saying, please answer the question that I asked. And instead, what we get is another shifting the burden of proof. I don't think atheists can prove that consciousness is merely material. Correct. We can't. So what? I, I, I don't know.
All right. Here's one. Let's have some fun. Leo in Wisconsin, you're on with Hemet Meta. Yeah, what's going on, bro? Oh, we're, we're just waiting. Oh, I just want to talk about uh, Lucifer. Okay. All right, I got a quote here from... No, no, let me pull it up. I got a quote here from Kanye West, quoting, I sold my soul to the devil. I know it's a crappy deal, but at least it came with a with a few toys like a Happy Meal. Another quote from Eminem. I sold my soul to the devil. I'm going to hell. I heeded to hell. I want the money, the women, the fortune, and the fame. That means I'll end up burning in hell, scorching in flames. Leo? Um, Leo? Also want to talk about... Yeah, hello? Yes? Is it possible that somebody said they sold their soul to the hell, sold their soul to the devil, and actually did not sell their soul to the devil? I mean, is it possible? Yeah, but if you're famous, why would you want to talk about religion? I mean, you're already famous. You already made it. You already disproved. Man, you're Christian Leo, you, you, if you just answer the question that asked, things would go a lot easier. Is it possible that someone might say that they sold their soul to the devil when they didn't? Well, you didn't listen to the words I said. If you said, if you listen to what I said, I said, Leo? yes, it is possible. Yes. And you kept talking after that. Most See, I asked a yes or no question and you said yes. And then you went on to something that was secondary or relevant. Here's the follow-up question. If it's possible for someone to say that they sold their soul to the devil when they didn't really, how do you tell the difference between who sold their soul to the devil and who didn't? <clears throat> Hey, him, it's back. You tell the difference. Hi. I mean, if you're going to be under Lucifer's <clears> control <throat> and he wants nothing but to drag people down to hell, <clears throat> why would people who sold their soul and legions to them? Leo, would have Leo, are you going to answer the question that I asked you? You're not allowed to talk about that. Are you going to answer the question that I asked you? I got disconnected for a good second and now I just chimed in and I have no idea what the hell he's talking about. So maybe I didn't miss anything. You didn't. Leo, how do you tell the difference between someone who really sold their soul to the devil and someone who didn't? You, you can't. You can't. Okay. If you can't tell the difference, then that means you have no way to identify if anyone has ever sold their soul to the devil, right? Okay. What does that have to do with anything? If you have no way to show that anybody's ever sold their soul to the devil then the conversation is useless because if you can't show that someone actually did sell their soul to the devil, then for all you know, nobody has ever sold their soul to the devil. That contradicts what people are saying. Why would someone sing a song saying I sold my soul to the devil? It doesn't it's because a, it's amusing, it's because, because it's amusing, because it's a story, because it builds a legend, it builds a reputation, because people don't believe in the devil. I've said I've sold my soul to the devil. Fucking Hemet sold his soul on eBay. The devil didn't go down to Georgia either. Yeah. Man, you are a fool. Look at Luke 10. I'm a fool. I'm a fool. I'm a fool. Leo, Leo, are. I'm a fool. How am I a fool? Well, let's, let's talk about Pope Francis then. Pope Francis has a video on YouTube talking about he's the man of sin. It's a 7.45, it's 7 minutes and 45 seconds. If you'd watch it, he'd explain himself. The Pope of Francis would explain himself. That he's talking about dragging people to hell and giving them the mark of the beast. Why um, Pope first, to say something like that, bro? I don't give a fuck why Pope Francis says anything. Is it possible that Pope Francis doesn't know what he's talking about and isn't telling the truth? How am I a fool just because you can't stay on topic? How? What? First off, man, you are. I know who you are too. Who am I? I? Who you are? Who am I? You're Lilith reincarnated. That's who you are. Awesome. You are Lilith reincarnated. Nice. Awesome. Does that mean I'm trans? Because that would be, you know, it'd be good for Pride Month. I, I'm Lilith reincarnated. I, I know. I know this stuff because I was born. I was born from the devil, and I was born into that family. I came from the Nephilim, bro. Cool. How are you going to tell me any of this shit, bro? 
I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you that you can't demonstrate the truth of anything that you're saying. First off, I, I own your soul, Leo. You, you cannot demonstrate the truth. Here, I can feel, feel your spiritual presence from over here, bro. I bet you can. You know why? Because you have been deluded into believing a bunch of pseudoscientific, supernatural nonsense, and you can't demonstrate the truth of any of it. Nah, you just oh, you you like to play questions with questions. I talked about a serious question from celebrities from their mouth themselves, bro. How come? It, how come? Everybody that's Christian has a harder life than people with celebrities selling their souls. Oh my bullshit. god. Bullshit. 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 Boo fucking who Christians. Boo fucking who Christians. Wow. That's you right, Leo. So people yeah. yeah, I know. I know who you are. I know exactly who you are, bro. I know. I'm Lilith incarnated and I own you, buddy. Wait, I what am I? Completely own you. It's not fair. I want a title. Nah, you don't own me, bro. You do. Oh, I completely own you, Leo. Jesus can't save you from me. You belong to me. You were born to me. You are mine. Ah, this, this whole show is just yeah, a fiction. Yeah, there we go. There we go. Yeah, there we go. Look at look at you talking some real facts now. Yeah, it's real facts. You you got it, Leo. I I'm more than Lilith. You see, that's where you're wrong. I'm not Lilith. I am Satan incarnate, and I own you. You're mine. You will never escape. Is that what you needed to hear? No, nah, no. Nah. Is that what you needed to hear? No, nah, that's not what I wanted to hear. I didn't need to hear that. You're full of shit, bro. I already know Lord and Savior got my back. Y your Lord and Savior couldn't give me so much as a hangnail. Yeah, because you sold your soul to the devil. No, I didn't sell my soul to anybody. But I even, if I, even if I sold my soul to the devil, couldn't Jesus still come down and mess me up? Another lifetime? Yeah, you did, bro. And at the end of the day, all the sins that you got on your soul, you can't hide behind the flesh, bro, because I know what you are doing. You are sitting there playing the reincarnation game, and you guys are saying, oh, well, that's not me, that's not me. But all your... What, what's the reincarnation game? I, I don't know what you're yeah, talking about. What is it? What is it? What's the reincarnation game? Go to the Book of Enoch, bro. Let's go to the Book of Enoch. I don't need to go. To the, why is it when I ask you a question, you want to reference something else? Can you just tell us what the reincarnation game is? Go to the Bible, bro. The, cause the, no, I want to go to the Bible, bro, because the Bible references the reincarnation game, bro. Well, the Enoch's not in the book. Of, they're not in the Bible. But um, so, but would you just answer the question, or am I going to hang up? I guess you're going to hang up because you don't want to talk about the Bible. I I, I know more about the Bible than you. Guaranteed. Okay, let's and go. I talk about the Bible all the time, but you said we were playing the resurrection game, and then you said go to the book of Enoch, which is not in the Bible. So why don't you tell us what the resurrection game is? Then let's go to Genesis 5, verse 18 through 22. Let's talk about that verse, bro. Okay, what about it? What about it? What about it? Just go to it. You got a Bible in front of you? I got loads of Bibles in front of me. Do you have a preferred version? King James version. Which King James? The 1611 King James or the King, the new King James? There's more than one King James version. Just uh, find the old King James version. Just go to Genesis. Sure. Genesis chapter, chapter, chapter five. Eight. Uh, hang on. I'm getting. We're, we're in the middle of a King timeline. James right there. People are living hundreds and hundreds of years. Okay. And then they die. That's so you, you said start at verse 18? Verse 18 down to 22. Sure. And Jared lived 162 years and he begat Enoch. And Jared lived after he begat Enoch 800 years and begat sons and daughters. You think people actually lived 800 years? Yeah. Okay. Well, that's, that's something you can't demonstrate, which is absolutely antithetical to everything we understand about science and biology. Um, well, and so said pharmacy bullshit poison and on top of that half the world got fucking parasites because you assholes created garbage ass food okay so verses 18 through what we didn't even get into methuselah yet 18 through 22 18 through 22 uh and jared lived 160 years began enoch uh and Jared lived after he begat Enoch 800 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Jared were 962 years and he died. And Enoch lived 65 years and begat Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. 
basically you had me read five go. verses that are just about people living a long time. What's the point? No, the point was Moses wrote Genesis, right? No. Right? Correct? You who don't wrote? know who wrote Genesis. The point was you wanted me to read Genesis 5, 18 through 22 in order to explain the resurrection game. Reincarnation. Oh, game. Sorry, the reincarnation game. So how does that explain the reincarnation game? We'll go back to that. Okay, well, now, now, that, now that I proved that Enoch is spoken in the Bible. Now oh, my God. I'm talking about the book of Enoch, dipshit. I'm saying the book of Enoch is not in the Bible. You're the one that referenced Catholics. I didn't say the person wasn't referenced in the Bible. Exactly. Well, that's what I'm saying. He was taken out Goodbye. of the I don't want to play the reincarnation game. You will not be reincarnated. You are the weakest link. Goodbye. I'm still trying to get over. Kanye said he sold his soul in a song lyric, and that's supposed to mean something for us. Yeah. But, you know, hey, I'm Lilith. Yeah. Congratulations on that, by the way. It's fun. We're friends. You never told me this. I know. I was actually, I was playing Binding of Isaac earlier, and I was playing as Lilith. So when he first said I was Lilith, I thought he was just joking. Yeah. All right. So we have a, a call from, uh, is it Sohaib in, in Canada? I apologize if I mispronounce that. Yes, speaking, yes. Hi, hey, you're on with Matt and Hemet. How are you? Good, good. How are you doing? Good. What's your question? Yeah, I just have a question about the afterlife. Uh, like, I'm a Muslim, so um, we believe that there's, like, a heaven and a hell. And um, what are your thoughts on the, the the concept of a hell in Islam? What are your thoughts? I mean, it's as fictional as the Christian version of the same thing. If there's no proof of it, this is the life we have. Make the most of it. Do you have any reason to think otherwise? Y yes, because, um, you see... Don't you think uh, it's a better option that you can just believe in it because uh, because it is a very very um, the fire of uh, hell is uh, seventy times hotter than the earth. Earth is fire. that what's? Are you saying you are a better person because you believe in that and it's stopping you from doing things? Yeah. Yes. What is it stopping you from doing? Like if you suddenly doubted hell, what is it that you would start doing? Anything, anything that's uh, because there's no God to punish me. You, you know, neither of us believe in hell, right? Uh, yeah, I know. So what is it that we are doing that you think is awful? Well, you don't believe that Allah exists. <laughs> Correct, but I don't see how that's hurting anybody. Right. I mean, you... If you if you stopped believing in Allah tomorrow, would you just run around murdering people and stealing things? No, but I wouldn't see any right. consequences of doing that. So you wouldn't see consequences of of murdering people. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Like um. You you don't think that the consequences are that person is dead and you have hurt another person and there may be consequences for you legally as well. And that if you promoted a world where people could just run around killing each other um, without any consequences, that that world would be worse than a world where there are consequences for it? Okay, yeah, I get what you're saying. I totally get that. Uh, I agree with you. But um, I'm just saying, like, uh, it's uh, basically, in my religion, um, like, uh, you see, God, he gives you everything, and then... Um, you have to appreciate him for what he he gave you. So, I don't have any I don't have any evidence that God has given me anything. I don't have any evidence that there is a God, and I certainly have no evidence that God has given me anything. What has God given me? What can you prove that God gave to me? Your life. You can't prove that God gave me life. Water and you can't prove that God gave me water. You, you, these are things you believe. These are things you've been told. How do you demonstrate that God gave me life? It's, it's not possible for it to come from nowhere. It just has to come from somewhere. Like, there's no you something created. Where are you getting that information from? 
that you you think it couldn't have arisen in any other way. Therefore, your interpretation, Allah had to do it. The Quran has that in writing somewhere. Like, where are you jumping from? I don't know where it came from. Therefore, my religion has the right answer to it. Here's a weird question. Do you think that Munkar and Nakar are going to ask you easier questions than we are? Or Nakir? I can't tell if we lost him or if he's just quiet. Oh, we lost him. All right. So one of the things is that in, in is, is Islamic afterlife, there's this notion that there's two angels. I think it's Munkar and Nakir who... Um, Will like interview to test the faith of 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 the Muslim in question. I don't know that much about it, um, but if you can't answer, if you don't have answers to to questions like, "Hey, uh, how could you demonstrate that you know God gave you life or God gave you water?" It's it's weird to me that that's where that goes. Mm -hmm. I also well, really want to know what he thinks he would be doing if he thought God wasn't watching him or if hell didn't exist. And I'm scared to know that there might be an answer to that. Yeah. I, I've had people just flat out admit that they would rape and kill and do all that kind of stuff. I don't believe them. I think that's a bit of hyperbole on their part. I'd yeah. love to have him call back and find out what's going on. But we have uh, Tanner in Utah has a question about um, dealing with people who don't care about their, their beliefs being true. How you doing, Tanner? Hi, I'm doing well, Matt. Thanks, Hemet. Yeah. Um, I appreciate you waiting. Go ahead. Wanted, of course, yeah. Just a little background, really quick. I am a foreman. I got that term from you, Matt. I think yeah. better than ex-Mormon. So. <laughs> I like it. Um, and I've been having, yeah, it's good. I've been having some conversations with family lately and uh, talking to my dad, uh, it's, it, it, I, I realized, and, and he fully admits this too, that he does not care whether or not his beliefs are true. Uh, that that just isn't something that matters to him at all. And so, I don't know how to move forward with a di with other types of conversations about religion with him because he just admits that he doesn't care. So I'm wondering if you, if either of you have any thoughts on how to try and progress forward in that type of a conversation. Can I ask, Tanner, how old are you? I'm 28. So, I mean, are you living outside the house? Are you on your own? Oh, yeah. No, I, I have my own house. I'm okay. married. We have a kid. Um, so, and so I mean, it, it, it's just we, we live nearby and we see each other frequently. I, I mean, the answer that I, I would have is I don't necessarily know that that's a conversation or a argument or a debate that I would necessarily want to have because... Again, if I'm thinking to my own parents who are religious, I don't think reason or logic is going to convince them to change their minds on it. Um, and also, I don't necessarily know that I care about that debate that I really want them to change their minds. Like, I do plenty of stuff trying to convince people to, to leave religion, but none of it's specifically targeted at my own parents. And I guess my question is, um, I get that your father isn't really trying to, he doesn't really have a grounding necessarily in his faith that has to do with whether it's true or not. But also why is it important for you that he either change his mind on it or get a firmer foundation, I guess, for lack of better words. Yeah. Um, Mormonism, and I'm sure this is in other religions as well, but Mormonism really goes hard on demonizing people who leave. Uh, yeah. And it makes it just makes me uncomfortable that his religion demonizes me in that in that type of a way. And I, I really want to be able to have good conversations with him. And I, I'm not trying to talk him out of religion or faith or anything. Um, it, it just it, he he makes in my conversations with him like feel like I am the crazy one for caring about what's true because it's just so he just does not care. And, and so I, Tanner, I I'm, I'm happy to just leave the conversation Tanner, alone it's just crazy tanner he does care he's lying everybody cares 
Ask him <laughs> if he gets in his car, does he care whether or not it's true that his brakes are working? Ask him if he crosses the street, does he care whether or not it's true, whether or not there's a bus coming? Ask him if I you can borrow $20,000 at 40% interest and whether or not he cares if you're ever going to pay it back. He cares about the truth. Yeah. And so ask him, ask him then once you get him to acknowledge that he does care about the truth because he absolutely does. How is it that he can care about the truth for something trivial and something important but not for the most important thing in his life, which is whether or not there's a God and whether or not there's an afterlife, whether or not what he must do to be saved, what he must do to, to, to earn the favor of the God that he believes in. How could he possibly care more about the truth of the brakes on his car than he does about a God? He's lying. How does it affect your yeah. life? I mean, like, does it affect his relationship with you and your children? I mean, it does to an extent. Mormon is very, very family oriented, very intensive on shaming people that leave uh, that type of thing. My family has been really great. Uh, otherwise, we, I just like to have these types of conversations and he just can't get past the fact that he doesn't care if his church is true or not. But it, it sounds like it's you either kind of go with what Matt said on uh, asking him about other things that he care about is true or not, or just where I have been lately is just leave the conversation alone and don't bring it up. And I, I'm fine with that as well. I was just wondering if there is a way to move forward past that. That's the best way I can think of. Show him that he does care about the truth and then get him to acknowledge that he, what he really wants, as far as I can tell, is to not have to talk and justify his, his religion. He doesn't want to have to defend his religion yeah. to anybody else. And that's a different thing than whether or not he cares whether or not it's true. And it, once he says that, the second he says he doesn't want to talk or defend his religion, you have to drop it because mm -hmm. it's not your job to fix him. And you don't get to force people to give an explanation for what they believe. I don't make outgoing calls here. I don't force someone to call in or defend anything. You, you call in if you want to. Um, your dad's the person who never wants to call into this show. And the fact that he, I mean, Mormonism especially, but when you're, in a religion that demands so much of its followers too it's kind of hard to imagine he doesn't care about this thing that really does take over your life in so many ways i agree yeah i agree i and, and i apologize tanner but i gotta let you go we're over time there's like two more calls i want to try and get to real quick uh but that's the best advice we're gonna have for your Thanks dad and, and, and just you. keep loving your dad um and cut him some slack to the to the biggest extent you can Perfect. Appreciate it, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Uh, Tanner. I got two more calls I want to try to get to uh, because they've been waiting a very long time. And we're going to start with the one who's been waiting longest, and that's Brian in New Zealand. Thank you so much for your patience. Hopefully, this is something I can knock out really quickly. G'day. G'day, Matt. G'day, Hammett. How are you? Hello. Cheers. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, g'day. Yeah, it should be a reasonably quick one. I, I was listening to Talk Heathen um, oh, a couple of months ago now, uh, and there was a caller who called in and his claim for the proof of God was that without God, uh, there could be no free will. Uh, and he did a pretty poor job of pretty pretty poor job of arguing it. But I, it, I'd imagine it with me right, and I was thinking about it. I was thinking about it, and it occurs to me. And I guess I just sort of wanted to see what your thoughts were. It's not something I've ever heard discussed on the show, but it might be. It's probably something you've heard before. But it it seems to me that if if there's an omniscient God who knows absolutely everything even before I'm born, every decision I'll ever make and every everything I'll ever do, then I can't possibly have free will, right? Because anything no. I do, it's already, he already knows. No. Right? So I, no. I, I'm driving along no. the road and I can turn right or left, but no. God already knows I'm going to turn left, right? Yeah, no, Brian. So the the only, in order for there to, 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 to God, for God's knowledge to, to contravene your free will, um, it has to be a situation where God knew everything, uh, could have picked a di to create a different world and picked and, and created this world. So God had to create this world knowing everything you were going to do. That means that there's no free will, and that is the model of the cl God of classical theism. 
merely the fact that God knows it doesn't mean that you still didn't have free will because you're still the one doing the choosing. And really what you have is someone knowing what's going to happen. Um, but that doesn't necessarily Im impact your free will. And if God created this universe, but this was the only universe that he created, it basically could still be entirely deterministic where God isn't superseding your free will. He's just aware of it. Like someone who watched a pre-recorded TV show. But if God picked this universe instead of a different one, and he picked the universe in which you turned left instead of turning right, then you definitely don't have free will. Yeah, it's interesting. Yep. Yeah, okay. Yeah, th I mean, that was, yeah, that was really, I, I just, you know, it was just something that's kind of been sitting a bit wrong with me, and I've been trying to, you know, it seems to me that I'm a, I'm a puppet and God can see the strings, right? But that's the, that's the only, uh, yeah. that's the closest thing to free will that I've got. Yeah, if, if I think so. God, which I, I'm, I'm an atheist. Yeah. All right, cool. Well, thanks very much. Appreciate you. Cheers. Time. Thanks, Brian. All right. Last call for today. William in Ohio, you are on with Matt and Hammond Matter. Hey, man. How you doing? Hey, Hammond. First, I ah. want to say, Hammond, I love your. I'm sorry I'm, if I'm saying the name wrong. No. I love your videos on Genesis. Oh, thank you. Um, Excellent. Yeah. I, they therapy to me with, okay. with you Matt. i just want to say like i i grew up in a family christians evangelists bishops even my friends who don't go to church they believe in god and several years ago i started finding your videos and the questions i used to have that these pastors used to try to answer they just didn't make sense you had the same questions and you would answer them and it just gave me therapy oh so, awesome i'm glad it was helpful both you guys how, how can we help today yeah, but dear, Here's where you can help me at. So I'm raising a child. I got everybody around me believing in God. I don't even know what to tell my daughter sometimes. And I still hold on to a little bit of belief in God because my aunt who recently passed away, she was like only a couple of years older than me. She used to talk about the end of the world and the mark of the beast and one day it's going to be a worldwide catastrophe and the world was going to be in chaos. And after she passed away, COVID-19 happened and just all the things she used to say, I kind of see them. I don't know if it's in my head or not, like they kind of come in the past. And that one little string makes me still hold on that it maybe is possible with some type of God out there. So that's my right. part question. Is, really. is your question how to deal with your daughter or how to make sense of your aunt's predictions, if you will? Both. Um, I mean, in terms of the prediction, COVID is obviously bad, but there are always tragedies that are happening everywhere at all times. I mean, if not COVID, you could point to climate change as an existential crisis. You could point to earthquakes, hurricanes, tsunamis, what have you. So COVID is definitely in our face and unique. Um, but I don't know that, that that doesn't necessarily mean that your aunt or the end times predictions called that into question or saw that coming from a mile away. They didn't. They did not predict COVID from a mile away. So I don't buy that she was on to something with her beliefs. Um, so I wouldn't put much stock okay. in that. In terms of raising your daughter, how old is your daughter? Eight. Eight. So she's at an age when she's going to start asking questions and start thinking about some of this stuff. And I'm only saying this as someone who has two kids, both of whom are younger than than she is. Um, but I, I genuinely think the best way to handle her when she's talking about this stuff is not to tell her God exists or God doesn't exist. It is to get her to question this stuff. Ask her what she thinks about this. If you are an atheist or pretty close to it, um, and she says that, you know, I think heaven exists. I think God exists. The best question you could ask her is like the annoying kid question of why? Why do you believe that stuff? What, or why do you think there's something up there? What about people who don't think there's something up there? Where do you think these good people go? Bad people? I mean, make her think about this stuff if she's raising questions about it or if she says to you, I believe in this thing that you know, that you know is wrong. Just get her thinking about it. I think it would be wrong for me to teach my kids God doesn't exist. People who believe in God are wrong. It's almost unfair for me to feed them the answers like that, and it's not going to stick. I, I genuinely think the best thing you could do is get her to start thinking about this stuff and ask her probing questions. That's a good thing because... 
you're not telling yeah, her what, what like, I've been doing. What I've been doing to tell me if you agree with this or not. I have been saying this is what I was taught, and I'll tell her what they taught me, and then I'll say I'm not sure if it's true, but when you get older, you have to find out for yourself. I think that's you a think wonderful that's a answer. Thing, or... Yeah, I think that's yeah. a wonderful answer. And by the way, especially like I think you said, you're surrounded by people in your family, in your community who are super religious. I, I, I think it is going to be important for her to understand what it is all these other people believe, whether or not she ever goes along with it. But I think that's a great thing that you're asking her to say, look, at some point, you're going to have to figure this out for yourself. I'll love you no matter what you choose. But yeah, it, it is helpful to say this is what these other people believe. Maybe this is why they believe it. I don't personally believe it. It's going to be your decision. But I think the better thing to do is just make sure she's always asking questions that there isn't. Like someone's, she's going to be surrounded by people who tell her there's one right answer to this stuff. And it's not the right answer. Mm -hmm. And I think just to remind her that, no, there are lots of people who think very differently about these things. And no one gets to force their beliefs on you. You're going to have to figure this out. And by the way, there's no deadline for this. It's not a class project. You can think about this stuff for the rest of your life. And you know what? If there's a book you still like or, or YouTube videos you like, great. You can always point her in that direction, too. But again, just get her to question and don't tell her she's not that you're doing this, but don't tell her she's right about it or wrong about it, especially if she says something like, I don't think God exists. I don't think you should tell her, good, you figured it out. Like, let her keep questioning. Mm. Let her figure this stuff out on her own and let her know that she can always come to you if she has those questions, because like they're going to be maybe even pastors in her life where she won't feel comfortable if she has doubts going to them, but she should feel comfortable going to you if she has doubts or if she starts to think God does exist. Hopefully she sees you as someone safe who she could talk to about this stuff. Okay. I guess my problem was I didn't want people demonizing her saying she's living in darkness or she's a sinner and all this stuff. If she took on the beliefs that I had. So I kind of wanted to, like I tell her, like it's a Santa Claus, or she's about to come out of that stage. But I, you know, believing in two theories and all that kind of stuff, should I go ahead and promote Christianity while she's young, and then later tell her? You know, that's no. where I was drawing the confusion part apart. No, I think I mean, let her know where these people are coming from. It, it's unfair that they very well may tell her she's going to hell if she raises these doubts. But I think it's important to let her know. Look, you got to keep questioning this. You got to figure it out. There are going to be people she encounters who feel like they are 100% dead set, they got the right answer on this stuff, and they're going to treat her as if she might have the wrong answer and let her know that's that's not okay. She could push back against it if that's the case. But questioning this stuff is important. And, and to do what you might see on a show like this one, which is ask the questions right back to those people who seem so sure about it. Um, the demonization is not okay. And I don't know what you can do to stop that. But to teach her that there isn't, I don't think it, it is worthwhile to teach her Christianity is true, only to take that back later. I don't know that you can undo that later on. Um, but to let her know this is sense. what a lot of people believe. And you should understand where they're coming from when they say things like this. But it doesn't mean they're right. Um, but I'm tell you could tell her this is where I'm coming from on this. These are the questions I asked. But um, I, the better thing you could do is get her to know what type of questions to ask. How do you treat people with kindness? Because okay. these people who are demonizing her are not. Yeah. I have nothing to add to that, William. I'll just say I agree. And thank you for calling and hope that helps. And call us back and let us know, you know, how things yeah. are going. Good luck to you. All right. Thank, thank you, guys. I appreciate the help. Thank you. Absolutely. That will bring us to an end of this episode of The Atheist Experience. I, I had a lot of fun, um, but maybe I had too much fun because in hindsight, I'm sad. I'm sad that religion has turned a caller into someone who's so terrified of conversation and reality that they think I am Lilith or Satan. I'm sad that in order to keep beliefs sacred, people can't listen to the question that they're asked or answer the question that they're asked. Religions put up barriers to thinking. My friend or our friend, Seth Andrews, famously did a talk about wearing his God glasses. 
And that really is what's going on. As soon as they, they fit you with your God glasses, there's a protective barrier to what you can actually see. At to the, the beginning point where, the to the point where it's affecting someone's daughter who hasn't made up her mind on this stuff. Right. At the beginning, we were asked if there was real, measurable, positive things coming from our work. The real good, in my opinion, is helping people remove those glasses and encouraging them to be good and do good for goodness sake, not because some God expects it or wants you to. The measurable part is in how many people's lives are changed, how many people are giving up old notions of God, and in studies that measure societal health versus religiosity. We've been pointing to some of those studies, including one from Gregory S. Paul, for over a decade or more now. There's not only miracles that decline as our ability to investigate them increases, but our solutions to problems increase as we give up the notion that a God can or will intervene. Humanism is not, there is no God. It is, we are here and have to solve problems on our own uh, to the best of our understanding. Humanism, skepticism, atheism. I want to thank Habit Meta for joining me here this week. Please be sure and check out the Friendly Atheist blog and his videos as well. Thanks to the crew uh, who will pop their name up right after you guys get a good look at those links there. And thanks to all of you who tuned in, who contributed, who donated, who who commented and added to this conversation, including the people who called in. We'll see you next week. Please stay safe. Take care of each other. Well,